So let's get started with part five of this video series, which I want to share with you. We've covered file edit text layer. We have select view and window left. Um, I'm going to group all of these together in a certain way because the select window has got a few of them only window exactly the same. View has got quite a lot, but in the view window, we are not going to cover studio. That's going to be in the very last uh, part, which is part six. And with studio, we're going to cover the tool menu on the left hand side here. So tool menu plus the studio section, we're going to be covering in the final video. The rest of it, we are going to be discussing now. So let's get to select. I'm going to just create a brand new document. And when we look at select here, it's quite common to make a selection of everything on a document and deselect everything. So it's not something that I think we need to explain in excessive detail. However, we see here there's an invert pixel selection. And why would we have an invert pixel selection if we don't have anything to create pixels with here? If you had followed any of the other series, you'd realize that we have a pixel persona here. And that's where we have the ability to do selections of pixels and group selections. So if we are able to do a selection and then we move across to Affinity uh, Designer Persona, we'll be stuck with this. We can't select it anymore. So we'll have to come to the select bar and to say deselect. That's the only way we can do it when we've moved across. The other thing is also if we go th again through to pixel area, if we've made that selection and we go back to the Designer Persona under select we can then click the invert pixel selection because now we're working with a pixel selection. This is not the vector object selection. So there I've done an invert and then I can invert again and that is to deselect all. But that also works that if I have normal objects which are the conventional vector objects, they also will work. So I can go select all and then I can go to deselect. All right, let's get on to the next area here where you see select next and select previous. Now we've gone through this before where we were showing how to use control alt and square bracket to go through the different layers. And I'm going to just make a bit more layers here so or more objects uh, so that we can just demonstrate this a bit clearer and we make some nice colors here so we can have some exciting colors on the screen. So they are all on different layers here on the side. So what this would do is if you select, um, I'm going to press Control Alt and right square bracket. So if I go Control Alt and right square bracket, I'm able to cycle through these layers. If I want to go the other way, I can go left bracket and go up and down. Again, okay, just a reminder, if you've watched some of the other videos with a selection menu area, if we wanted to take one of these objects on a layer and move it down a layer, then you could then not, you just avoid pressing the Alt and you just, whichever layer you're on, you press Control and then you use the brackets and it will move that object down the layers. So this is moving the object. When you add Alt to it, then it will move through selections that will move through the areas to select that area. Okay, so that's, that's been covered already before, but I think what would be of interest is something I haven't mentioned is if you have objects like this, say overlapping each other. OK, we can go and select them in the layers. We can do this navigation that we just showed now with the, the control alt and the square brackets. Or if we're working and we focused on this area to go down the different layers, if you want to select We've got this blue area and we want to select, say, that, that brown ellipse at the back there. Uh, we can keep the Alt button down on our keyboard and click the left mouse button. So you click and every click you have, you will move down the layers. Let me show you. Keep Alt down and click. Look what's happening. It does exactly the same as doing the Control, Alt and Square bracket. But this is, this is the way that I find I work better. So if I'm looking and I see down here, I may, maybe want to get to that back one. Let's, let's, for example, say this, this back area is like tucked away like that. And I want to get there and I'm right on the stop one. 
I know it's at the back here, so I could press Alt and on the layers I see there I go and I've got it and then I can move it. Okay, so that is a bit of a modification of this tool and I use it most of the time. Alt and just click through it with a mouse. Okay, so let's go to Windows. Uh, here we have two, four, five different parameters. Well, it's a fifth one because there is a document open. If we open up a second document, we'll see it pop down here. Maybe we should just do that. So we have two documents under window. You see here we're able, if I click on the first one, it will hop in between. So this for windows will jump between these windows or these documents. Or I could just click in the panel on top to shift between the two of them. Then we have float and float all. Float just means it takes these windows and it, it literally undocks them from um, where they are. So they are stuck in this area. So I'm going to say all of them, I'm going to loosen them. So I'm going to float all. So it's pretty much, it's, it's just floating. And that's what it means. It's floating. I've got a second screen. So often I would just move it onto the second screen so I can focus on, on one screen at a time or preview it. And I'll show you a tool just now if you if you're wanting to work with it in, in a zoomed in view on the same view you're working, you can do that. But this is just for undocking the windows. If you want to dock them all, you can go there. If you say dock, it will be the one that you have focused on here. So if I've clicked on the one here and I say dock, this one will dock. Um, if I say dock all, both of them will. OK, so I'm going to just show you here if I'm on this one and I go and I say dock. It's going to dock that window and this other one still stays undocked. If I'm on this one and I say dock, it's going to put them so both of them are there. So let me just show you again. I'm going to float all. And they squeezed onto my other window here now, but I can come here and say dock all and it will bring them both of those back. If it's five windows, it will do exactly the same. OK, so let's get on to the view menu. Um, as I mentioned, I will be covering the studio section, which is all of these, and this menu section in part six, which is the final video series of this Affinity Designer Basics. OK, so when we look at Zoom on top here, Zoom is it's just a whole lot of shortcuts that you can set up for different features. You know, when you're working, you kind of have to get used to those quick keys that you can move through the objects because you don't want to be uh, learning the software while you're busy being creative. The one tool I pretty much use most of the time is Zoom to Fit. I, I don't use many of these others here, but you can find the ones that suit you and the shortcut keys. If you want to change the shortcut keys, there's uh, the video, I think it's the part two, where we speak about in preferences changing shortcut keys. You can go there and see how to do that. But I use Zoom to Fit, which is Control Zero. And this is how it helps me a lot. If I'm working and say I'm on a screen or I'm zoomed right in over here and I want to zoom out, I'll go Control Zero and it brings it nicely into perspective for me. So that's how I use it most of the time. These uh, three settings here are to rotate the canvas. So when you have an object and you rotate it, that's one thing. But if you want this entire surface to rotate, and in some cases you want to rotate it because you may be working on a touchscreen desktop environment or a laptop that's touchscreen, and you want to turn the canvas a little bit at an angle when you're busy with maybe a, a brush or something, then you can do it here. You can say rotate left. It gives you a little turn. Um, to reset, of course, we'll just bring it back to zero, rotate right, the same thing. And if you want to turn it more, you just do another rotate right. I'm going to reset there. OK, so that that makes quite a bit of sense there. With the view mode, I think it's important to understand that when you're working in a vector environment, a vector is an outline of full color and that full color can have a gradient in it. The outline can be also kind of a any color, any thickness to it. But when you're done with it, with a design, you often have to export it out to be used in another program. Now, if you're exporting it to the web, you most likely will have to export it as a JPEG or a PNG if you need transparency to go along with it. Um, if you're putting it out to a printed document, you can still maintain the, the vector quality in a PDF, a, a printed document. If you're sending it out as a SVG, which is 
becoming more popular with websites to maintain the vector ability, you can do that and still maintain your vector. But most of the times when you're sending it out for most purposes on the web or or just sending it in, in generally in most directions, you're going to have to convert it to a pixel based image. Now, often if you're working in this environment, you want to see how it will look when you export it. And pixels, yeah, if I click on pixels, it will just show me how it will look when I export it as pixels. So it, it simulates what it will look like. Uh, pixel retina, that is what it would look like, uh, I assume, if it's on a retina display. Uh, with the Apple environment ecosystem. By default, it's on vector. And then we have outline. I'll show you what outline's meant for. But the reason why I'm showing you this and not clicking on them yet is because I want to show you how it works with this menu item here. So this is single view. This is what we're seeing now. When I go to split view, it's going to give me a split view of one side is showing vector and the other side showing pixels. So this is a more productive way of, of examining it. It's kind of an A and B scenario. So you can do this little comma or I'm going to just click on this. When I click on this, you see there's a line that comes in here. If you look here, it says pixel and there's vector. What it's doing is going to simulate on the right hand side of this what pixels, what it would look like. So if I zoom in, can you see here, it's showing me what these pixels will look like when I do export them. If I hover over this, the arrow will change. There you can see that's what this particular object will look like when I export it at this magnification. So I'm zooming in now. OK, if you look on top, yeah, I'm zooming to 163. So if I go, say, to close to 100 percent, that's what it will technically look like. So if I move this across, my vector image will look perfect. But if I export this now, I'm going to be sitting with that kind of visual. So I must just be aware that the sizing and how I export it. So I don't have to guess anymore. I could do a simulation of this A and B scenario where I can look and see what the pixels will look by, like and then make my adjustment accordingly. So this is just a simulation of what it would be. It's not the actual setup. So I'm going to go there and I will just disable this a and B view, get back to a single view. But before I click there, you see this outline. This is an excellent thing to help you when you're working with lots of objects that are overlapping each other and you want to manipulate them. I'm going to go back to single view. These three areas here are representative. Here you see pixel, retina pixel, and there's outline view mode. It's exactly what we have over here. It is pixel, retina, and outline. It doesn't give us vector icon on top here because we assume we'll be working in the vector persona all the time. OK, so instead of me going back to that menu now, I'm going to just show you if I click on to outline, this is what happens. Can you see we can now go in and I can manipulate these and see it a bit better because I'm not having all these things interfering with me. I, I could do my edits because I know where I'm going to. Once I'm happy with that, this is a kind of a a transparent skeletal view. In When you're doing 3D modeling, you often would switch on this, uh, if you can call it this X-ray vision, so you can see through the objects and manipulate them. Because if you don't, I wouldn't be able to select this and select this like this. It would see the entire object as, as blocking my way. Whereas here now I can go through the object because that's the only line that I want to select. I can go into the box and select it there. And this makes kind of manipulation very nice. When you're done with it, you basically flip this back on. OK, so if I wanted to take this uh, greenish turquoise thing and and maybe tuck it underneath, I know it's sticking out here. I could go in there. I know it's this one sticking out here. I could probably go in there and then maybe I do that and I come back and I see, oh, I should have taken it a bit more. All I do is I click back and I don't have to worry. I can actually just get in. Even if I'm over here, I can go, I know I click on that and then I can tweak it up there and get it back. OK, so I know I'm showing you a practical usage of it, but that's where it comes in. Very useful. The the view, that particular view, the outline view. OK, then this is one aspect that I'm probably going to spend a little bit more time than I usually would on these settings. Just to explain that there is a difference to using a clipping clip to canvas 
when you are working in certain environments. So there are two basic environments that you can find yourself working on is the one is a document, which is a single document. This is just you can't get a second document next to it, standing next to it. You can create a second document and it will be up in a, a tab and you can flip through it. Yes, but you can't put a second document next to it. However, when you're working with artists or with working on an architectural thing or working in vectors or even with website designs, you want to create layouts, user interfaces where you have three, four, five artboards next to each other that you can look at each other and simulate how they look alongside each other and that sort of thing. That's where you're going to create an artboard. And an artboard gets created. I'll just go to the one that we have here. This is a normal document. To change it to an artboard, I can go to File here um, and go Change Setups here if I want to, but I prefer using the toolbar here. I'll just click Artboard and it will say Insert Artboard. We'll say Yes. Okay, so there I have an artboard and this particular artboard now is quite different to the document that I had before this. So I had a document, then I had another document that I converted to an artboard. Now the power of the artboard is that I can take this, I can, let me just grab this, duplicate it, I can make a, maybe that artboard, I can take another one here. So I've, I for example, got two artboards and this one I maybe want to simulate with a green, this one I want to simulate with a bit of red, I can design things on here, I can work with it, but they're all on the same environment. Now, I'm, the point I'm going to get to is that feature in the view area but to explain it well and you understand it in context I'm coming down this route of explaining the artboards first. When I work with the artboard I want to take some objects that I'm working with and put them around the artboard. I don't want them on the artboard because I want to still think it through. So let's say for example I take this this kitty and I put it there and I take this box and I put it there and I take um, what else can we take? Maybe I'll take a picture. Let's just, this is just a picture PNG and I put it there. Now I'm sitting and I go like, okay, I think what I'm going to do is maybe move this onto this object. Uh, maybe this kitty I'll move over there. So I can go, okay, now I'm going to take the kitty off and just leave it here. I'm working in the artboard. Whatever's on the artboard is going to be part of my, my final process of going through. But the elements that I'm using, I can put them all around my artboard and pull them on at times. As soon as the object touches the artboard, look at this. As soon as it touches the artboard, whatever portion was sticking off the artboard just goes invisible. So I can keep that in that area like that. If I pull it off, then it's then I know, look here, when I can see it, it means it's not been used on any of the artboards. Okay, that is the primary thing that I want to show you here as it relates now to this next example that I'm going to show you. This is on a document. And I think for simplicity's sake, I'll choose the same cat. Copy this cat. Well, let me bring it back here. Control V. This very friendly cat of ours. And I'll delete those areas. So here we have a cat now. Now this is not an artboard. So if I pull this off the artboard, there's something strange happening. On the artboard, this will go transparent. And I'd only see this area. Now, if I pull this totally off here, I still see it. Okay, so how does this, what relevance is this view now in this whole discussion? If I go to that view mode, this clip to canvas is something that makes this particular image that I'm using clip off the document. So this clip to canvas doesn't work with artboards because artboards treats the object inherently different. When it's partially on the artboard, it will show on the artboard, not off the artboard. When it's totally off the artboard, you'll see the object. But that feature doesn't exist on the document. Because here, if I'm on the document, I'm still seeing both. When I'm off, I'm still seeing it. So to give it that ability here as a document, I use this clip feature. So when I go here and we say view and I say clip to canvas, this backslash. So I'm going to just use the backslash on the keyboard, backslash. There we go. Can you see there I've got it now when I move it off. It now behaves just like the artboard behaves, but on a single document. When I move it there, it's still showing as soon as I get it totally off, something crazy happens. It doesn't actually show me the object. It disappears. 
Okay, so the difference between an artboard and a document is quite stark when it comes to how it deals with objects that get dragged onto it. Here, the clipping plays the biggest role in what you see or what you don't. So if I go back slash again, I'd be able to see this whole item. And when I drag it on, it, it doesn't kind of do that clipping for me. So it's almost a, it's a very sort of awkward way of doing it. It's not intended to, to be as streamlined as the artboard. That's why we have this clipping feature that I have to clip it, um, put it over there. And it's not anticipated that if I'm working with, I don't sit with one document and I'll have a whole lot of, like if I go with another object here, if I click off them, I see nothing here because it's not designed to do that. However, if I go back slash, I'll see those objects that I have here, but then they just stay visible no matter whether they on the board or not. But say I'm happy with that. My workaround will be a backslash, which will then clip it to the board. And there we go. Okay, that's been a bit of a kind of up and down explanation, but hopefully you understand those two because it becomes quite crucial when you're working with a single document and with odd boards. So I'm going to just close these views and I'm going to open up. Let me just close this document and I'll open up a new one. Let's go new document. The next one is, is a very interesting feature. If I'm, for example, say working with, let's take our favorite little kitty there. If I'm working with, with this kitty, I, I maybe got these two. Let's, let's do something that, that will show relevance in what I'm trying to. Okay, so we've got these two kitties. Okay, so I want to say there's a bit of a conflict here and I want to see something closer. I'll, I'll have to go in here and kind of manipulate here and say I try to do a little circle here and maybe make that what color a bright oh yeah let's see what we can do I, I want to show you a kind of purpose so I'm going to move this one oops I'm going to move this behind the eye so I'm going to go let's see control bracket there we go so say I'm doing that now I've just moved it down the layers so I want to work on this eye, but now I've got to work and then I've got to zoom out and see what it looks like when I'm done with it and maybe go in and do all of this. So, so this kind of setup where, let me just get to select that and delete that. This kind of setup where I'm working close here to create the eyes, but I want to see the full context makes it difficult. So this is where this tool comes in view and it says new view. What it does is it creates a replica of what I'm working with, but in a different window. Now I've got two monitors, but you don't have to have two monitors to benefit from this. Uh, let me show you. I'm going to create a new view. All it's doing, it looks like nothing's changed, but if you see here and I click here, it looks like I'm not moving between them, but they a duplicate view of each other. Okay, now these two views, if I go to view here and you look at view here, you see these are two views. These are very different to Windows. If I created two new brand new documents, then Windows will show up two brand new documents. But with the views, it's jumping between these two views I've created. Now I'm going to undock the second one. Okay, and then I'm going to just make it a bit smaller and just move this one here. Okay, so this is why we create a kind of a new view, is that we... The new view is a replica of this, but it gives you a different environment. You can zoom in here and it doesn't affect that one at all when you're zooming, but it's the exact same document. So here I can go in close and I can go, okay, let me take, let me go and I want to select this object here. I can go in there. Is that it? Then I'm going to Alt. Now I'm seeing this in full view. I'm Alt and drag another copy here. Can you see? I can see the overall effect on the entire thing. While I'm over here, maybe I want to go and change this to maybe a red eye. Now I can see the effect there. I don't have to be in this thing doing a, a slight modification there. I can do the modification in the zoomed in window and leave that one out. So I can come in here and I'll say, let's see what it will look like if it's, if it's a little red eye like that. I'm seeing the big context. So the whole idea of this window 
new view is you're creating a brand new view of the same thing but you are able to zoom and have a different whatever you're modifying on it will change here but your zoom factor doesn't translate across so you can really go and be granular in what you are doing here and have an overall picture in the other monitor as such okay you can undock this if you want to or just be happy so this for me is is very exciting in that now i can come and i can work on to little fine areas maybe i want to go uh, node tool uh, this thing me convert to curves and maybe i want to see i can do this and maybe on this thing here can you see that i can see what it will look like on overall even though i'm working so close here so that's the power hopefully you see that i'm excited about this kind of feature i did a video separately showing this feature and I think it's a, a great one to use when you when you have a total big image and you're working granular on small stuff here. Okay. Oops. I've now converted that into curves. That's why it's making those multiple selections. Right. Let's get going here. Let's see. We're going to go to views. That's what I said. If we had the two open, we'd be able to shift between them. Now, these areas here that's got all show next to them. These things are showing the bleed. So if you have a bleed on your document, it will show it up. It will show margins, show guides and so forth. So I'm going to just go through that so that we can, I'll create a new document with all those features and then we can have a look at that. Okay, so it's pretty much that view is just to show it and just to hide it. So we go to new. I'm going to with bleed, I'm going to just create a bleed on, oops, maybe make it more obvious, maybe 12. So we have margins, we have bleed, that's, that's good. We're not going to create an artboard, we're just creating a normal document. Let's say, okay. There we can see we have a bleed out there, which is 12 pixels. We have a margin here also of 12 pixels. So this view here will just say, show the bleed, which it's doing by default. If I click that, you don't see that bleed margin. Yet the the document will know that the bleed does exist. This is just so that you, maybe it interferes with how you looking at your document. You can hide it and show it here. Show margins. There it's gone. Show it. Uh, guides. Here we go. Uh, we don't have guides on the screen. Guides are used to, when you want to have like horizontal or vertical guides, to get the guides, you have to pull it out of the ruler. So it's left mouse and drag out of the ruler. Now, sometimes you'll get to a point where you won't have a ruler here. Now, you saw it disappeared. There's a shortcut key, Control r for ruler, which if you look down here, it says Show Ruler, Control r Now, you need to have the ruler to drag it onto the surface. If you don't have the ruler and you don't want to use the ruler, there's another method by using the, the Guides Manager to put in those guides. But it's usually good just to have the ruler and drag it down and we can just drag a second one down. Let's drag a vertical one. So those are guides. And this is, for example, if you wanted to go and draw something in there and then you want to draw something and you know it's aligned to those guides. So guides are very crucial when you're doing layouts on documents or layouts on artboards. These guides play a big role. In addition to these guides, Affinity has got a nice column guide tool it will create a shaded column area for you that you can work with also. But we'll get to that as we go down this menu. Okay, so let's see here, uh, show grid. Now grid, okay, hide guides. I didn't hide the guides. Let's show them again. The grid is something, I'm going to show the grid. This is like that grid boards when you used to do, um, I know at school we used to use these boards. You can set these, the spaces, the blocks in between, you can adjust them. That will adjust a little bit down the way here. These four areas are where we do the adjustments of the grids, adjustments of the lines and everything can be done there. But this is just showing them if they do exist. Okay, so I'm going to just hide the grid. So I disable this, click on here. Let's go to the next one is show column guide. That also exists inside these settings and they're not enabled because what it's showing now is one long column. And when the column is showing, there's no need to show it as a column because it's treated as one column. As soon as we add a second column, you're going to see it's going to indicate the two columns. And we'll get to that now. Now, Okay, and then show rulers. That's what we've got to. Lock guides. Sometimes if you're busy working and it's 
very convoluted around you don't want to accidentally move a guide so if I come in and I hover over one of these guides you'll see the arrows change so it gives me the ability to move it but if I don't want them to move I can go in and say lock the guides and now when I hover over it I'm not able to move these guides at all okay I just want to disable that and then we come to our good friend which we'll be dealing with in the last video assistant manager this is like a help along the way that if you're doing something and you are maybe breaking the rules for example you're trying to erase a a vector object um, and you're not sure that it's going to be doing what it's doing the program understands sort of intelligently that you might be not aware that certain things like it's converting the object into pixel based from vector because that's the only way it can do the next process it will pop up a little assistant to say listen here be warned this is happening so you can switch this on or off but these are the different things where you can create what it should warn you about uh, I'll show you for example if I have this object now and I go to the pixel persona and I'm going to use er eraser and I'm doing this you see it will pop up and you say the assistant added a new mask layer inside the layers you previously had selected you are now erasing from that new layer Can you see it's done a couple of things here but it informs you what's happening so that's a brilliant tool to have on if you need to use it okay let me just delete that here we're going to go down to the guides manager now the guides are these ones these vertical and horizontal when I open it up you'll see something interesting here if I if I click on here and I change this say to 45 and press enter look what happens to this you saw that line went up or if I take the line and move it so these are records of where these lines are on the page so I can manually double click on here and say put it as 89 and it will move exactly to 89 millimeters down I can flip this onto a percentage also if I want to drop in a horizontal guide if I click here every guide that gets dropped in gets dropped in halfway so if I click here you see it will go halfway and I can move it to where I want it to if I drop another one there I can decide where I want to move it to okay or I could just drag it off the top ruler area and then position it accordingly same thing with vertical guides if I put it there we can move it Okay, yeah, if I want to remove one of these guides, I can take it and drag it right off the page and it will be gone. Or I could just press the delete button and it will delete whichever one I've selected there. Okay, so if I want to delete that one, I've deleted those guides. Here, I spoke about the columns because there's one column. Now remember, these aren't columns for you to go type in text and for it to move between columns. This is just a guide. This gives you an idea of where columns would be so you can keep your your design uh, aligned so if I as soon as I click two you see it pulls in these gray pads just to say that's the columns and if I don't want it a full color I can just have it as an outline square but this is this won't be printed this is just giving you an idea so that you can keep things neatly uh, aligned here I can come and change the the shading or even to a color if I want to okay but I, I prefer using the black there and if you create more columns that's what happens this gutter is the space between them the margins top left and all so you can move all your margins accordingly it's all up to you rows you can increase rows so this is if you wanted to do a, a, a area with a whole lot of equal squares around so it gives you that flexibility okay once it comes down to one then of course there's no columns that show um, let's go further we got snapping manager now the snap manager is the same as this here okay and you can go through it you can enable snap to the grid so if you switch on that grid and you want to put objects down and you want it to snap these are quite incredible you also have a lot of presets that you can set up to work with it so it's quite intense and that would be intermediary uh, lesson to go through not in this basic course so you, but you can fiddle around with it and save a preset if you want to if you find some things that work well for you now we go to grid and access manager I'm not going to deal with these move to previous viewpoints and that okay that's for more advanced grid and access manager if I click on that um, in this particular place here now we're not seeing the grid because remember I switched it off I'm going to just show the grid again 
If we go in there, we can now set the grid to be at different spaces from each other. We're going to just choose. If I switch it off here, I can disable it also. But I'm going to show you something with a centimeter square. So that's centimeter square. And then the lines, we can make them fade out a bit or make them more bold when we're busy doing it to design. So if I wanted to create a, a design here, you see I'm, I'm working like this, but it's it's not snapping to that grid. If I go into this and I'll say, let's snap to the grid. Okay, so I've got that on. Now when I go and draw an object, look what happens. It will snap to that grid as I'm working. Okay, so that's the purpose of using the snap to grid and that sort of thing if you need to use it. But this is how you formulate your grid and you can make the areas much bigger, etc. Okay, um, I'm going to just not show the grid. I don't use that all the time. It's just specifically when you want to be focused on the dimensions exactly, right? So we're going to go now to these as we come to round off this session. Show context toolbar. So this, a context toolbar is whatever you're putting onto the art, artboard or onto the document has a toolbar that is relevant to it. So if I move on an object like this, You'll see here, these are the tools that come with it. If I go and I choose a piece of text and I type a W in there, when I select that, this toolbar changes totally. This is a context toolbar. So if I want that to show every time I'm on it, um, I can have it, and usually by default it's there. Or you will have to right click onto an object and modify it here, or pop out a character little block from the studio to modify it, but it's good to have this context bar pop up here. If you want to not use it for all the stuff you're doing, this is where you come to view and you can say disable show context toolbar. So whatever you're creating, whether you're selecting an object there, no context toolbar comes up here now, but you really want that to be on all the time. Okay, then the next one here is show the toolbar. Now the toolbar is above the context here. These are the tools that are used and these are tools that are used most of the time. So that is busy showing in the same way. If you click this, it's going to disappear. If you click show toolbar, it will come back. But the other important thing is here, customize the toolbar. Because there's sometimes you might find certain of the things you're seeing on my toolbar doesn't exist on yours or you might find more on yours than you can see on mine. That's because you are allowed to customize this toolbar to your liking. So if I click Customize Toolbar, you'll see this come up here. These are spaces in between here that has been placed. It's not accidental. You, you literally would put a space in there to maintain these spaces if you choose to. Now, let me show you that, for example, this force pixel alignment. I'll take it and just, even though it's here, I'm going to take it out and drop it. So I've taken it out there and dropped it over here. And if I close this now, that bar is missing that snap bar. Okay, so I can go back in here and I can go say, let me customize it again. Or on this top toolbar, I can find a space. I right click and then it says customize toolbar. If I click that, that same dialog pops up and I can grab this window and drag it to where I can find a space. Maybe I'll put it in there and let go. And when I close this, we sorted out there. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed there was another option when I came to right click here. There's icon and text. It's only showing icon. Hide the toolbar and customize. So the customize and hide is visible in our menus there. But here we can choose also to show text. So initially maybe you're struggling to understand what each of these things are doing. You can click that and then it will literally show you this is to arrange objects this is to align objects and when you click on there, it pops through to give you all the alignment features, etc. This is for snapping. When you become familiar with it, you can right click and say let the icons only show. Okay, so that is for the context menu and that toolbar. And let's get down here. This next one here is to dock tools. Okay, so dock tools means that this toolbar over here is docked against the side. So these tools over here. Okay, these tools are different to the stuff that you find in the studio, but we'll be discussing them all together. 
to dock the toolbar means that the toolbar has to be loose. So you there's no undock toolbar. When you disable this, it will undock itself. So let me click there. So here you find the toolbar like this. So maybe you want to work and keep the toolbar here and, you know, do your adjustments here and then function over here. If this is how you want to work, then so be it. Um, you can keep the toolbar floating around with where you're working. But if you want to work with it being docked over here, then we pretty much go back there and say dock. It will dock it back in here. Below dock, there is show tools and don't show tools. So the docking means it's just going to loosen it up be there. But if you don't want that to show at all for some reason, you can just disable it and then that toolbar is missing. Okay, but I, I don't see any reason why you should not show the tools. I use it so much all the time. Then you get to customize tools. Now, customize tools is similar to, to this here where you customize this top toolbar, but customize tools is for this left hand section. You can see they're all positioned together. So if I go to customize tools, you're going to have a dialog box that pops out. Same principle here is you can drag stuff across. Now, here, this particular thing, when I click on it, it gives me artistic text. And there's a little pop down window that will tell me that I can have text inside a text uh, framework. OK, so if I hover here, artistic text, if I hover there, frame text tool. These two are embedded in this one. So to use it here, I had dragged over this one. So I could also take this out, drag it here and just drag this tool in here and drag this tool here. So these two tools are the same that occurs in this one. And when I use them now, I can use them individually. But I, you can see how easy it is for me to drag it across. I prefer using this as a single, single clicking. I'm not sure where I put it. I think it was there as a single click and then the things will pop out. So anything that's got a little pop out area, they have sub areas that it shoots out. So this is how you drag out here. If you don't want this thing in here, you can just drag it out into the area. At the bottom here, it gives you the ability to create columns. If you want three columns, that's how you can do it. My preference is two columns. And then I close that. So that setting view for customized tools is to bring that across. Then your final one here, as we come to a close, is toggle the UI. So toggling the UI just means taking all of these toolbars out of the way and just showing me the screen so I can see this on its own in full, in its full glory. So how do I do that? I can go in there and press that button or I could just press the tab button on the keyboard and move in between. So this is quite nice when you wanting to preview and have a look at it in full screen mode and you go tab again, get it back. And of course, remember, my favorite key is the control zero to center everything in that space. OK, so hopefully this session is just short of 45 minutes, but it's covering quite a lot of stuff down here. Our next session would probably be somewhere close to that because this is a lot of features in here. As I said, I won't be covering the ones I've covered in previous sessions um, and going through the toolbar, showing the practical uses of it. So that one, the last one, part six, might be the longest of all, but it's, it's one that you'd probably value the most from as far as actually doing the job, working with stuff. That's where you start to get hands on with it. These other things were giving you understandings of what the different uh, menu items are. This toolbar and this area is what you probably have to know the most of. So look forward to seeing you in the next video, which is part six, which should be our, our final video in the series Affinity Designer Basics.